Okay, good morning. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Paul Johnson, director of the IFS, uh, and welcome. Welcome to our new offices. Uh, uh, it really is a, it's a, it's a huge pleasure and privilege to be um, doing the green, uh, the green budget here uh, in the city, in the Guildhall, for, um, uh, for the first time. Um, uh, next year, we'll have to find somewhere even bigger looking at the, uh, looking at the size of the audience uh, here today. Um, I'm here really only to um, introduce, uh, introduce the event. Um, as ever, uh, I leave it to my colleagues who uh, did all the work in putting together the Green Budget uh, actually, to, uh, actually to, do the, uh, to do the presentations. Um, I want to start off just by uh, thanking them for all of the work that they've, um, they've put in. Uh, thanking the uh, ICAW for supporting us again uh, this year and contributing uh, to uh, very, um, uh, very interesting, influential chapters, and to the Nuffield Foundation for uh, providing uh, financial support, uh, and to the ESRC, whose financial support uh, underpins pretty much everything um, that the IFS does. Uh, we will. Uh, uh, I'm not going to pop up here um, every time someone comes up to speak, so I'm going to introduce the whole thing right now. Uh, right after me, Andrew Ratcliffe, who is president of the ICAW, will come up uh, and say a few words uh, about, uh, about the ICAW and their support for this. And then Andrew Goodwin from Oxford Economics will talk about the macroeconomic outlook. Um, as you know, the IFS um, thinks that's a mugs game. That's why we get other people to do it for us. Um, and, uh, uh, and then uh, Carl Emerson and Gemma Tetlow will talk about the uh, uh, fiscal rules and the risks uh, the risks of the public finances. There'll then be a break, um, and then uh, we'll come back to uh, listen to uh, work from the ICAW on the whole of government accounts and infrastructure funding, uh, and my colleagues speaking about excise duties, corporate taxes and BEPs, uh, and, uh, and universal credit. So there's, a, there's an awful lot as ever in the Green Budget, and we'll be trying to synthesize that today uh, in the best way uh, that we can. As ever, we're looking to, uh, through this, give you some sense of the difficulties and options that are, are facing the Chancellor as he comes into uh, his budget uh, in March, um, and hopefully uh, you'll go away with some idea of uh, what a difficult job I think he's going to, uh, difficult job uh, he's going to have. We will be leaving plenty of time for questions, both at the end of this session before the break uh, and at the end of the uh, next session uh, at the end of the morning. So the questions come after uh, these three people here have spoken, not, at the after, um, uh, not after each one of them, but we will try and leave plenty of time if they keep to time, which I'm sure they will. Um, Andrew Ratcliffe, do you want to come and say a few words uh, as president of the ICAW? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Paul, uh, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and let me add my welcome uh, to the Guildhall to uh, launch the uh, IFS Green Budget for 2016. ICAW is the professional body for chartered accountants, and we're delighted to be working with the IFS again uh, this year, together with ESRC, Nuffield Foundation, and Oxford Economics. Uh, we've got 146,000 members working in more than 160 countries around the world. And in the UK, our members either work in or advise probably more than one and a half million businesses. We stand for high quality financial information that can be used to inform good decision making in all economic and business endeavour. And we certainly hope the IFS Green Budget uh, will continue to be widely used uh, to help in that. Now, in his New Year address, the Chancellor said these are uncertain economic times. Uh, as others have, co have commented, a bit of a change of mood from what he said in the autumn statement. Uh, and certainly, our latest business confidence monitor, which we published last week, shows a continuing decline in business confidence and is currently suggesting that UK growth could slow to around 0.4% this quarter. Now, in those times, independent, evidence-based commentary on the economic choices and challenges that we face is absolutely vital as we continue to learn how to do more with less. And the Green Budget certainly offers 
this much needed perspective for policymakers and the electorate in general. The UK government is committed in law to delivering a budget surplus by 2019-2020 and has also committed to funding a range of infrastructure projects to promote longer term economic prosperity. Achieving both of those in an environment of uncertain economic conditions would indeed be remarkable. And I think our contribution to this year's report highlights that problem. Uh, in one chapter, we build on the analysis we did last year on whole of government accounts, which give a much starker picture of the public debt, public sector debt than the national accounts do. And in the second chapter, we explore government options for infrastructure projects. Uh, Ross Campbell, our Director of Public Sector, will be expanding on both of those chapters when he speaks to you after the break. I won't steal his thunder. But these competing policy priorities certainly need deft financial management over the course of this Parliament, with realistic assessments of what is affordable and how these projects can be funded. Two weeks ago, uh, we at ICAW published a new report in our Better Government series called A Modern Finance Ministry. And that explores the need for continued development of structures, people, processes and systems in the mechanics of how our public finances are managed if that is to be achieved. Now, Andrew, time to get on with the show, I think. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, good morning to you all. Uh, before I start my presentation, I'd like, uh, on behalf of Oxford Economics, just to uh, give a quick thank you to the IFS uh, for having us here again. Uh, so the fifth consecutive year now that we've provided the macroeconomic content for the Green Budget, uh, and it's a relationship of which we are very proud, uh, and I'm delighted to be here again today uh, to present on the, uh, the global and the UK outlook. Now, when we um, presented last year at the, the equivalent event, um, things looked pretty rosy for the UK economy in particular. Um, at least relative to what had come before. We just had the strongest year of economic growth since the financial crisis. Uh, we'd also had the oil price collapsing from about 110 bucks a barrel to 50 bucks a barrel. Uh, and that was offering the prospect of another year of very strong growth for net oil importing countries, uh, of which we expected the UK to really be at the forefront of this move. So I think you know, against that backdrop, what's happened in the 12 months since can only be classed from our point of view as quite a disappointment. Yeah, certainly, I think the idea that the UK economy only grew by 2.2% last year, you know, to, to us, that strikes us as being something that is, is quite some significant distance below par, given the sort of tailwinds that, that, that we had towards growth. Now, I'm not willing entirely to sort of write off 2015 just yet. Uh, certainly, experience has taught us that the initial estimates of GDP growth are, are very much that. They're initial estimates. Uh, they are uh, subject to very heavy revision over time. Uh, indeed, that chart there shows you just how much things have changed relative to, to last year uh, in terms of the, the, the recent history. Uh, indeed, if you look at the Bank of England's inflation report last, last week, their backcast for 2015 actually included growth of about 2.5%. 2.5%, from my point of view, seems about reasonable uh, compared to what we had in terms of the business surveys and some of the other high-frequency data. But even if that 2.2 that, that, that two 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 does get revised up to 25 that, again, would, would still be quite a disappointment, given the strength of those tailwinds to growth. So we, we are really starting from a point this year in the Green Budget, uh, which is quite some way, way below where we actually expected to be. The question is now, you know, where, where, is sort of really, first of all, you know, why, why have things turned out that badly? Uh, and I think certainly if you look at the breakdown of, uh, of the various components of economic growth, uh, and this, this involves uh, historical data up to Q3 of last year uh, and our forecast for, for the remaining quarter, it's very apparent that the parts of the economy that we expected to do well have largely done well. So, for instance, the consumer sector has really sort of benefited from what we've classed a sugar rush. So this, this sort of idea that very low inflation has boosted consumers temp uh, consumer spending power, albeit temporarily. And they really have come through. They've done their bit. They've contributed uh, roughly uh, about sort of 80 percent of the growth that we've seen over the last year. Uh, and contrary to, uh, to some of the myths around in the UK economy, that's actually the first time that the UK consumer has outperformed, has punched above its weight, really in the sort of period since the financial crisis. However, uh, quite a few of the other parts of demand have underperformed. 
Yeah, and I think I, I particularly look at the last two blocks on that chart there. The contribution from stock building, very negative. There was some, some slight concerns about the, the quality of data there. But in particular, I think we've really suffered from, from a poor performance on the net trade side. Now, again, some of the data looks particularly sort of dubious. I think the export data on the face of it looks quite strong in real terms, but in nominal terms, it's significantly weaker. So we think there are some issues with the deflators there. But I think if we look at the net position, we have seen a significantly worse outcome over the course of the last year than we had anticipated. Now, obviously, the strong pound is quite a big factor there. That, that's certainly, I think, uh, all of the business surveys in particular picked that up as a, as a limiting factor last year. But also, I think the sort of the, the, the long and, and, and fairly underwhelming recovery uh, of most of our key trading partners, in particular the Eurozone uh, and to some extent the US as well, uh, has also harmed the, the ability of UK exporters to, to grow. Uh, one of the other plus points, though, is business investment. Uh, you can see there the, the, the investment sort of contribution is, is actually relatively large, given its, si given its uh, relative size in the economy. So there's, there's very much a sort of uh, a story of uh, domestic strength or relative domestic strength and relative external weakness. So how will that evolve this year? Well, I, I mentioned the idea that, that as far as we're concerned, what's happened to consumers is, is something of a sugar rush. It's something of a sort of temporary boost uh, and one that won't be repeated sort of over time. However, over the last couple of months, we've had uh, that renewed fall in the oil price, taking the oil price down into the, uh, the mid-30 bucks a barrel. Uh, and that should be enough to, to really extend that sugar rush a little bit further into this year. So rather than having consumer spending power uh, effectively going back to more normal growth rates this year, we're actually looking at inflation remaining a little bit lower for a little bit longer. Uh, and the CPI measure of inflation probably not getting back above 1% until the, the very last month of this year in December. So that, that should sort of at least provide some support to the consumer uh, and certainly should, should ensure that the consumers should again at least punch their weight this year, uh, if not slightly exceed it. But certainly there, there is a very much a, a trajectory that is suggesting that the consumer sector is starting to ease off the, the further we go through this year. Now that picture is, is further confirmed by uh, what, what, what we've called our, our spending power index. This is an index that we've come up with at Oxford Economics, uh, which tries to effectively sort of give you a, an estimate of the, the pound in your pocket, if you like. Uh, what it is, is it's an index that takes the, the weighted average of income of the median worker, uh, of somebody who's unemployed, uh, and a pensioner, and it takes off debt servicing costs, because obviously that, that, that isn't uh, sort of disposable income in, in its purest sense, and it also takes off inflation. So effectively it gives you a sort of a measure of real spending power. Now what happened to that index last year is that we had the strongest growth in that index since 2001 for the year as a whole. So that effectively sort of confirms the, the extent and the scale of the which the sort of consumers benefited. But as you can see from the red line on that chart now, you know, we're very much sort of at the peak of that, that boost now. Uh, and the further we get through 2016, the less that, that that sugar rush is going to affect the consumer uh, and the more we're going to be reliant on going back to some sort of sustainable wage growth again. Uh, and you know, the, the, the more we're going to have, be, have to rely on other components of, of final demand to actually drive economic growth forwards. What we're also seeing, if you then move sort of further beyond this year and into uh, to next year and beyond, is that the impact of the very large cuts in, in the welfare bill will also start to weigh down on the consumer sector. Now, obviously, the Chancellor rode back from his changes to tax credits at the autumn statement, and that's effectively removed the cliff edge, the, the sort of three and a half billion pounds or so that was going to be taken out of consumer income in April of this year. But yeah, as, I'm, as I'm sure you're aware, what he hasn't done is then change sort of the, the, the total savings that he, that he actually wants to accomplish over the course of the four-year period as a whole. So over the next four years, we're still looking at taking about £12.5 billion out of household income relative to what would have happened anyway. Now, that is quite a substantial chunk of, of money coming out of household incomes. It's also generally coming from the lowest, in, lowest earners in society, uh, and therefore those who have the highest marginal propensity to consume. So therefore, the impact on consumer spending is likely to be pretty significant. So we're, we think we'll probably go from a situation where consumer spending grows by around 3% a year last year and slightly lower than 3 this year, to a situation where we can probably only rely on it to contribute about 2% a year growth in the period from 2017 to 2020. So it really is a sort of sea change compared to what we've become used to uh, over the last year or so. What about the other parts of final demands? Well, on the investment side, things still look pretty, pretty solid as well. Uh, through 2015, we've probably had business investment growing by in excess of 6% again. So uh, getting on for three times as fast as GDP growth. Uh, and that's come despite the fact that, that, uh, that non-financial corporations have continued to run financial services. So effectively, corporations are still continuing to stockpile cash. They're, they're not spending as much as they actually get in. 
That's left us with a situation where, in terms of the financial backdrop, the financial backdrop for investment still looks very strong this year. You have companies with very strong levels of profitability. You have significant accumulated surpluses, getting on for 30% of GDP in terms of the amount of money that's actually just sitting there on deposit. You also have a situation where the sort of potentially the motivation for investment looks relatively strong. Rates of return, particularly in the services sector, are really as strong as they've ever been. And I think, as far as we can tell at the moment, uh, the BCM sort of accepted. Certainly, other sort of set, uh, other sort of surveys of business sentiment suggest that business sentiment is holding up relatively well. Yeah, not as well as it has done maybe a couple of years ago, but certainly it's been pretty robust to some of the bad news in, in, in the global economy so far. If you add in the fact that we've obviously got the national living wage coming in this year, uh, potentially a, a motivating factor to try and motivate firms to, to, to invest in sort of labour-saving machinery, try to uh, certainly I think in those firm, in those sectors where there is some sort of substitutability between capital and labour, that, that could be a motivating factor. Then the prospects for business investment, again, look relatively good for this year. However, I think as far as we're concerned, there are two key uncertainties that, that are sitting there in the background and two key uncertainties that could send things in the wrong direction. The first is obviously coming up potentially in June, on June the 23rd, that is the, the, the referendum on the UK's membership of the EU. Our forecast assumes that the UK remains in the EU uh, and it assumes that the opinion polls remain pr pretty sort of comprehensively in favour of remaining and therefore don't sort of push businesses uh, sort of towards a, a sort of more, more uncertain outlook and don't restrain business investment. But certainly, I think, were the opinion polls to swing towards the UK leaving, that could potentially undermine that very strong business investment story. And secondly, the global economy still remains very uncertain. Thus far, there's not a huge amount of evidence that suggests that that's really damaged business investment intentions to any great extent. But certainly, I think, were the concerns to escalate and were the global outlook to worsen, there is a very real possibility that that could also damage investment intentions and could start to restrain the story. But as I think in terms of our baseline forecast, we're still pretty optimistic and we could quite, quite easily see business investment grow by another 5 or 6% over the course of 2016, providing those risks don't start to crystallise. Now, what of the global economy? Well, I think, you know, obviously, over the last couple of months, there's been significant turbulence in financial markets. And certainly, I think if you look at this chart there, almost every time we've had a global recession, what you've also had is some very large falls in stock prices, and also some very large falls in commodity prices. And certainly, I think, amongst some commentators, there is a concern that the very big falls in, in those, those two variables that we've seen over the course of the last couple of months are effectively a, a leading indicator that the global economy is heading towards recession this time as well. I think on that, we would sound a note of caution. Certainly, I think if you look at the chart there, uh, about 50% of the time uh, that, that fall, falls in equity and commodity prices have correctly predicted world recession. However, 50% of the time, it's also been a false signal. So 50% of the time, that it's effectively sort of uh, suggested that well, the global economy is heading for recession uh, when, when we've been quite some way away. We tend to sort of lead towards the idea that this time around, we're not heading in that sort of direction. Uh, and really, really, the reason for that is because a lot of the other real economy leading indicators, things like the PMI surveys, uh, have suggested that we're not heading in, in any sort of shape, any sort of direction in that, in that sort of way. Certainly, that the PMIs are leaning quite strongly against that sort of story. They're suggesting that activity across the world is, is still expanding, not at a particularly spectacular rate, but certainly at a reasonable rate. And certainly, they suggest that the global recession uh, is, is still a relatively distant prospect. Uh, indeed, I think if we actually look at the global economy and the way that we expect it to actually develop over the course of this year, we actually see that global developments as being relatively positive for the UK economy. Uh, and that's because we see the, the developments particularly in terms of commodity markets, uh, as being generally sort of pro-growth in the advanced economies. Now, if you think about what's happening to oil prices, the impact it's having on consumer spending power, it's not just the UK that's benefiting from that, it's also the Eurozone, the US, and other advanced economies as well. Uh, and most of the concerns uh, are tend to be surrounding China uh, or some of the emerging markets, uh, and their area is really that the UK has failed to penetrate over the years. So what we're sort of left with in terms of the global picture it is one where we have the advanced economies growing relatively strongly still, or certainly at least no worse than they did last year, uh, and really the emerging markets where the UK does very little business uh, continuing to struggle. Now, if you look at the chart on the right there, if you add up the, the, UK and, uh, the UK's exports to the EU, uh, to, to non-EU countries in Europe, and to the US, you're getting on for almost three quarters of our exports of goods and services going to those relatively sort of fast-growing regions. So I think certainly in terms of the way things should play out for UK exporters, 
if you build in the fact that, that demand should be at least as strong, if not stronger than last year, and the fact that we've had that, that, that sort of weakening of the pound over the course of the last couple of months, what we should actually see is that the export side should actually be less of a drag on growth this year uh, than it has been in, in, in recent years. So that's the short-term outlook. I want to sort of move on now and, and think a little bit about the, the medium-term outlook, because obviously in terms of the green budget, we're looking at the period that goes out to, uh, to 2021, the, the end of the, the OBR's forecast horizon. And I mentioned earlier about the sort of difficulties that, that, that uh, sort of uh, revisions to the ONS data have caused. Uh, and in, in our view, they're less of an issue in terms of trying to short, think about the short-term outlook and the sort of deviations we've had there. And they're much more of a hindrance to us and, and to o the OBR and other forecasters when we're actually talking about the medium-term outlook. Because what we've seen over the course of the last couple of years is some very substantial revisions to the ONS historical data, which have caused some quite big shifts in, in, in what people have been talking about in terms of the supply side of the economy. Now, this, this chart here shows the OBR's forecast of potential output uh, over the course of the last three autumn statements. Uh, and it's actually quite apparent from this that, that the revisions to the actual ONS data have been so significant that the OBR have actually revised up their estimate of the level of potential output at the end of 2013 by more than 3% over the course of those two autumn statements. Now, when you think that the OBR currently estimates the degree of spare capacity in the economy to be 0.7% of GDP, that, that really does sort of put, put into context quite how uncertain the supply side of the economy is and quite how big a challenge this, this actually presents to, to forecasters. Because you know, though we're now moving away from a sort of situation where the government's fiscal target is, is, is actually tied explicitly to the output gap, the output gap is still phenomenally important in terms of the fiscal forecasts because it effectively gives you an idea of the degree to which we can rely on economic growth to actually sort of fill the gap and actually sort of close the deficit. Now, in our view, I think the, the sort of the OBR is still a little bit on the conservative side here. Certainly, we believe the output gap is much larger, uh, and we therefore believe that there's much more scope for economic growth to actually fill the gap, to actually close the deficit, if the economy were allowed to run at the sort of rates that, uh, that, it, could, that, that it would need to do to actually sort of close that and actually make it happen. Now, thinking about potential output and the way things will evolve, I think certainly, as far as we're concerned, the, the sort of the outlook for potential output is still pretty strong. If you look at the sort of factor inputs, so if you look at labour and capital, labour on the left-hand side there, the very strong growth in, uh, in inward migration over the last few years, I think, has surprised everybody. Uh, and I think as far as we're concerned, as far as the ONS are concerned, that's likely to be with us for quite some time to come. If you add in the fact that the state pension age is obviously moving up to 66 over the course of our forecast horizon as well, what you have is you have effectively some two very strong supports to, to the labour supply to, to really sort of encourage growth in the labour supply and to, to mitigate some of the effects of the aging population. So in terms of the impact to, on sort of labor's, in, labor's sort of contribution to, to potential output growth, there's still a very positive story, we think, for the UK, uh, and one, as you'll see from, from the Green Budget Report, which is quite, quite significantly at odds with most other countries in, uh, in Western Europe. On the other side of the, the sort of the ledger, in terms of the capital sort of contribution, that also looks pretty strong as well. We're a little bit sort of less optimistic than the OBR on the, on the sort of potential for, for business investment to grow over the next few years, but our forecast is still pretty strong. We have it growing faster than GDP in each of those years. And certainly, I think if you put those, those two pictures together, that does tend to suggest that the, the sort of the, the supply side of the economy is in relatively good health and should remain so over the course of the next few years. Now, ordinarily, that would pre present sort of the, the, the sort of the, the, the conditions really for some very strong growth in the economy over the next few years at very low rates of inflation. And certainly, I think we think that would be possible were it not for fiscal policy being quite as tight as it is. Now, we see this as being partly a sort of a function of the change in the fiscal rules, more of which uh, Carl will talk about in a minute, and also partly due to this sort of very conservative estimate of the output gap. But I think those two factors together uh, are, are sort of leading us towards a conclusion where we need significant extra austerity in order to be able to achieve those fiscal rules over the next five years. We actually take a contrary view we think that's actually now then going to, to weigh on economic growth quite significantly. And we think that'll actually, start, that'll actually restrain economic growth to the extent where it won't, we won't actually use up the spare capacity over the next five years. And there'll still be a sizable output gap there in 2020. Now, the obvious conclusion from that is that the government could, we, we think, relax the, the degree of austerity and actually just let the economy run at a faster rate without there being any uh, sort of potential for that to cause extra inflationary pressures. Now, we would certainly suggest that the fiscal stance as it stands today uh, is far too tight. So in terms of how that, well, how that actually sort of means, what that means in terms of the, the outlook for, for growth, 
That means that over the course of the, that five-year forecast horizon, we're looking at growth averaging just over two and a quarter percent a year, uh, which, yeah, on the long-term sort of uh, in a long-term sort of context, is, is fairly weak. Yeah, certainly, the UK is, is accustomed to two and a half percent or possibly more. And certainly, I think coming out of, uh, of a very deep financial crisis, where obviously output is is, is more than 10 percent below where it should be, uh, had the pre-crisis trend continued. That sort of outlook for, for growth is, uh, is one that is quite disappointing. It is one that is slightly more balanced over the course of the next five years. You know, those, those sort of contributions to growth are, are much less reliant on the consumer, but that is almost by default, uh, simply because the, the welfare cuts are taking so much out of consumer demand over that period that effectively it's forcing the, the other sort of components to, to, to really sort of to make up the, the gap. Now, I think we, there are sort of reasonable concerns around business investment and around exports along the lines of the ones that I detailed earlier. So I think what that does is it also leaves us with a forecast that, though not particularly strong, is also one that is quite, where the risks are quite heavily skewed to the downside. So I think certainly, I think if that forecast were to go off course, it is far more likely that we'll end up with slower economic growth over the next five years than faster growth. I want to finish by just, just sort of thinking about some of those risks in, in a little bit more detail. Uh, in, the, in the Green Budget Report, we've actually sketched out two fairly detailed scenarios uh, for the global economy and also two, two scenarios around the UK economy. Uh, I mentioned a, a, a little bit earlier on that, that Brexit, we think, is, is a particular uh, source of risk for the UK. Um, unfortunately, we think it's such a sort of source of risk, such, such sort of great uncertainty around it, that it's not really possible to actually cover the risks in this sort of uh, format here. Uh, we've actually uh, just completed a multi-client study uh, on Brexit, which we'll actually be launching to, uh, to, to the media and to the wider world in, uh, in mid-March. Uh, but as part of that, we've, we've managed to identify nine different scenarios uh, which, which the UK could follow where it's have actually voted in, in favour of leaving the EU. You know, as far as we're concerned, there are so many different possibilities in terms of the relationship that the UK may have with the rest of the world and with the European Union. You know, there are you know, a vast number of different, different alternative outcomes. We haven't uh, explicitly sort of t t put that into the green budget, but what I will say for it from that sort of work, it's very apparent that most of the, the scenarios in terms of Brexit uh, fall on the downside. So most of them involve a worse outcome in terms of GDP growth than the baseline forecast. And what I'd also say is that the more liberal uh, approaches to policy followed in those scenarios, so that the less that the, the migration is restricted, the more that the government follows a sort of free trade agenda, the more positive or the less negative those outcomes are. So effectively, sort of li liberal outcomes tend to be better in terms of economic growth. In terms of the two scenarios that we sketched out in the UK chapter of the Green Budget, uh, these two here are the, are the two that we see as being the most plausible. Uh, on the upside, we think there's a, a reasonable chance that, that oil prices could fall further. You know, the, the scenario that we have has oil prices falling down to 20 bucks a barrel uh, over the course of the next year. We think if, if you were to have that sort of scenario play out, that could drive the UK towards a couple of years where growth is in excess of 3%. And that's partly because of the, the sort of sugar rush effect that I spoke about earlier. And it's partly because that also stimulates growth in some of the other developed economies as well, which, as I demonstrated earlier, are key to our export prospects. On the downside, the scenario that we think would be most damaging to the economy in terms of sort of the global developments would be if the, the Federal Reserve actually followed the path of the dot plot, so actually followed the sort of course of interest rate hikes that they themselves have actually plotted out. Were they to do that, that would actually involve quite a significant reassessment of risk on behalf of financial markets who don't believe the Fed will follow through with their promises. And that could cause quite, quite significant problems in financial markets, uh, effectively an extension of what we've seen over the course of the last few months. I think where we'd see that scenario, the UK would be relatively exposed to that because of our, our, strong, sort of, uh, our strong exposure to financial markets in general. And that could see UK growth dip towards some, somewhere in the region of sort of 1.5% to 2% for a couple of years. I think beyond that, almost every other scenario that we can think about is, is on the downside. There are obviously concerns about China amongst emerging markets in general. But I think that the, sort of the, the, the key takeaway from, from what I'm sort of suggesting today is that you know, we have a, an outlook in terms of the baseline forecast, which is not particularly strong. It's, I think, at best you could call it solid, certainly not, not spectacular. But I think if, say, if things do go wrong, it's far more likely we're going to follow one of these downside scenarios here, either the sort of one here around, around the Fed tightening or one of the other ones that I've alluded to through my presentation, than it is that we're going to follow some sort of upside scenario. So I think in terms of the impact and the, and the likely sort of impact on the, on the public finances, it's not a particularly rosy picture uh, as far as the economics goes. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>